Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. We're live in Hanoi today talking about Vietnam's emergence as an alternative to Chinese manufacturing in the face of a trade war. One challenge for the company is definitely going to be infrastructure, getting goods from a factory to a port, for example, because suppliers here have to convince their customers, hey, we can get your product made, but also we can get your product delivered. Getting goods from the factory to the ports is going to be key if Vietnam's going to be a manufacturing powerhouse. Their railroad lines are sparse. They have highways, but not the eight-lane monsters that China's famous for. And there's always a reminder, it's still an agrarian economy, the world's third largest exporter of rice. And the goods wind up here at the port of Haiphong. This terminal was opened in 2008. It's about the size of 100 football fields. Some of these boats are going to Japan. The containers carry things like apparel, electronics, and auto parts. In a year, they'll move about a million containers of this size, but that's where the bottlenecks began. This is the only port in northern Vietnam directly accessible by rail, which puts more strain on the highways. There's another issue. Vietnam is often the last stop for some cargo ships headed to the U.S. They usually load up in Indonesia and Malaysia, meaning suppliers have to fight for cargo space. Finally, Vietnam's long needed a true deep water port, and they're building one way down there, but that's not going to open for another three years. David and Sarah, Vietnam has invested about $11 billion in construction projects uh, in 2017, the World Bank says they need to be doing more like 16 to keep pace with all this growth. Interestingly, the interim CFO of Tapestry was asked about this very topic on a call earlier in the month. She said that right now there's uh, no real uh, spending to keep pace with the growth. It's leading to larger lead times with more inventory, quote, in the water at any given time. So it's very clear that corporate America is aware of this issue, too. Guys? Yeah, well, as you point out, Carl, I mean, you, it's not like you can create a uh, six-lane highway overnight. Um, what are the long-term plans in, I mean, I would assume they are in place. In, in 10 years from now, can we imagine a very different-looking infrastructure? I think so. Uh, you know, a lot of it's going to rely on private uh, companies. Samsung came in, built an enormous cell phone uh, assembly plant, and helped finance a highway uh, right around there to get help workers get around. So it's going to be Part of that, part of it, government commitments. But as you said, these are not things that are going to get done in a year or two years. Uh, we're talking multi-cycle decisions, and it's going to depend on how much these companies want to be here for the long term. You know, I went there on my honeymoon, Carl, and I was, <laughs> I was struck by, you know, outside Hanoi and the rest of the country, yeah, there are, there are manufacturing plants and factories, but, but you mentioned in that piece there that it's still an agrarian economy. That's what you see. And you see fishermen and you see, you know, it, it's, a, it's a much different looking picture. I just wonder how equipped the labor force is there for this boom that is hitting them. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge debate about is Vietnam really going to trade in their centuries old rice exporting industry so they can go learn how to operate a sewing machine and make shoes for Nike. Uh, that's, I mean, that's going to be part of the game plan, but uh, switching that economy into a true manufacturing economy, like China did, took them 20 years, but they did it. That's the kind of uh, crossroads that we find Vietnam at right now.